All right, so it looks like we're live. What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, host and founder of My Seven Chakras, my7chakras.com, the show where we help you calm your mind, relax your nervous system, and experience deep bliss. Today's episode, we're going to talk about some really amazing topics, including sacred geometry, mandalas, soul blueprints, energy transmissions, and the power of vibrations. And if you like to explore more such topics at home or maybe in your car, then make sure that you hit the subscribe button on your iPhone or you hit the follow button on Spotify because it does something to the algorithm. I'm not sure exactly what it does, but it does something that ensures that people who would not have come across our podcast surprisingly come across it. So if you could do something for me now before we start this episode, make sure you hit subscribe or you hit the follow button so that we can spread this message. And with that being said, let's bring on our special guest for today, Baljeet Rayat. So Baljeet is an Akashic Records consultant and teacher, intuitive soul purpose mentor, sacred geometry soul artist, and conscious DJ committed to raising the vibration of humanity. She has worked with thousands of women and men worldwide to uplevel their lives by uncovering the truths of who they are to the core, creating profound results in their businesses and relationships. She believes everything in this world is energy and getting to the root of desire causes a powerful ripple that spans all areas of life. So I love that metaphor and that visual. And uh, with that, uh, welcome to the show, Baljeet. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you on our show. As uh, we both know that we were going to have it a couple of weeks back, but for some reason, <laughs> yeah. there were some tech issues. There was some work yeah. being done at my home, and so we had to reschedule it. Yeah. But I believe in divine timing, and I'm glad that it's happening today. So it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Likewise. And uh, before we sort of uh, started recording, we were discussing about the uh, about inspiration and the fact that I always start these episodes with an inspirational quote. And you have a special quote for us today. So maybe we can start with that. <laughs> yeah, this is like one of my favorite quotes, quotes by Jimi Hendrix. And it's when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. Mm. That is an amazing quote. And what? how does it speak to you in your life? I always talk about um, having healthy boundaries and then talk about claiming back our power and, and questioning things, like not always giving our power away to certain teachings. Um, and if something doesn't resonate, to ask deeper. And I really resonate with Jimi Hendrix's quote. I think he was really tapped in <laughs> as a musician. Mm -hmm. And some of this stuff just made me think even a little bit deeper to just to a question authority and so many other things. So yeah, it's, it's really about empowerment. Oh, wonderful. I think music does that to you, right? Music yeah. has a certain way of piercing through all the echo and yeah. allowing us to get to the essence of things, which is uh, the power of love. Uh, that's yeah. what it's all about, right? And so whether it's music or whether it's uh, breath work or any form of practice, it's all about understanding vibrations, which we're going to get into today, but also how those vibrations allow us to get to know our true selves, our essence and our core. And I usually start these episodes with the beginning. So maybe we could talk about... Um, you know, your childhood, where did you grow up and what uh, was your childhood like? Wow. Yeah. Um, I was raised, born and raised in London, Ontario. Um, at that time, it was a predominantly white community that I grew up in. And coming from an East Indian background, there was already a, like a divide. Um, and, you know, being East Indian, as you know, I, I was... Uh, raised in a very strict upbringing. So um, my parents were at the time very uh, strict and I felt like I couldn't really explore who I really was at that time. And I just kind of went by the rules. I went by, 
you know, what everyone told me. I went to temple each each weekend. <laughs> like I just grew up. Um, my background was uh, Sikhism, so I uh, studied Sikh religion and just was a, a certified people pleaser. And there was a lot of things in the East Indian culture with women where they, you know, at the time were not fully celebrated. Um, it's changed quite a bit since now, uh, since since then. And it was like, you know, when a girl was born, it wasn't like, you know, we, no one would pass sweets around. Whereas if a, if a boy was born, sweets were always passed around to different families. So there was such a difference with how Indian females were treated and how Indian males were treated. And so that really caused some major trauma inside of me. And then going to school was a whole other story. Mm -hmm. um, so I dealt with a lot of racism and uh, was bullied. So it was like, not only did I not feel safe at home, but I didn't feel safe outside. It was like, I had to develop these mechanisms to feel safe and to stay in my energy, but I didn't know mm -hmm. how. And so then I developed this mechanism of like, oh, if I'm if I'm a, a people pleaser, if I just do what people want me to do, then I'll be loved and accepted, mm -hmm. whether it's inside, you know, the family system, or if it's outside in society. Mm -hmm. So just following all the rules and moving forward around age 20, I studied architecture. And uh, then my parents are like, all right, we're going to start finding you a, a boy like you should think about getting married <laughs> I was mm -hmm. like what <laughs> and at that time that pressure developed a lot of anxiety and I mm -hmm. ended up developing a panic disorder and was right. going through deep depression I didn't realize how much fear I had about myself till I develop developed that panic disorder I didn't even realize how depressed I was um, so I was really questioning my purpose and I started to, I was always rebelling, but at that age, I started to really rebel. I started going to raise, I, you know, did some drugs. I went to like, really, that's when I discovered electronic music and, and really tried to do the opposite of what, you know, my parents wanted me to do and what society wanted me to do. And in the end, it was it was kind of like me hurting myself because all I wanted was to find what my purpose, you know, what, what's my purpose? Why am I here? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I went through this breaking point where the panic attacks were so strong that I was questioning, do I want to be here on this planet? I was having these thoughts of leaving the planet. And one night I sat outside of my apartment in Toronto. I was living at Toronto at the time and it was around 25. So fast forward, mm -hmm. I wrote a letter to God. I was like my first conscious letter to God. And I said, okay, do you want me to stay here? Or do you want me to leave? Mm -hmm. Tell me what to do. And that was my first uh, conscious way of saying okay like a, an ask of like hey do you want me to leave or do you want me to stay or, like tell me what to do you know mm -hmm. and the next day something really like happened to me I started to listen to my intuition and I heard look up energy medicine mm -hmm. so long story short I found a homeopathic doctor and through that I found um a teacher who teaches Akashic Records and an Akashic Record reading. And then I was like, oh my God, I need to learn this. <laughs> and my life did a, a 180, but I didn't realize that why, like the reason why I felt so miserable, the reason why I felt so disconnected was I was such a people pleaser and I was following what every else, everyone else wanted me to do versus mm -hmm. me asking myself, what's, what's my purpose? What am I here to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. And thanks a lot for sharing uh, your story. I know it can be very vulnerable for you to share what you went through during childhood and during your upbringing. Uh, it can be hard uh, as a lot of people who are immigrants in you know, various countries can, can relate 
Um, you were born in Canada, right? You, yeah, I was you born, born in Canada. Canada. But then there yeah. were obviously a lot of challenges. And what I took from your story was, and something that I can relate to as well, is mm. you can do or you can take a lot of steps to try to figure out what your life purpose is consciously. But there's definitely a lot of power in surrendering, right? Yeah. When you sort of surrender and you let or give full control to the universe to guide you in a certain path along a certain way, then that's when the universe unfolds and puts people opportunities and things in front of you, right? Yeah. And so my question to you is at that age when you were sort of uh, questioning whether you should be here on earth or not, um, and then you ask this question, what was your concept of God like? And maybe before we proceed, I think there's some some shimmering going on at your end. I'm not sure what the sound is, but I love this conversation. I would and I would want this to not have any audio issues. I wonder if it's my hair. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it's wonderful. Because yeah. <laughs> I notice it reduces when when I'm talking, and then when you're talking, it yeah, because I'm animated, and I'm like, okay, okay yeah. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Probably my hair. <laughs> okay, okay. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, repeat the question because then I got just. Okay. Oh no, the, the what what God meant to me. Got yes, it. exactly. Yeah, and yeah. obviously we're going to edit the other. Yeah. The, the previous portion. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah. You know, my my concept of God is what I was raised um, in, in Sikhism, which is God is everywhere. God is everything. So, uh, which I still think is is beautiful and, and relate to on so many levels. But I, I felt very disconnected from that. I didn't understand. Okay, it's, it, it felt outside of me. It didn't feel like it was inside of me with what I was taught. And in that moment, when I wrote that letter, and I'm glad you brought up that, that word surrenders is what happened. I just, I really let go. And I was like, and I also let go of the control as well of mm -hmm. how, how to fix myself and how to get the answers. I just leaned back and I was like, just show me. Mm -hmm. And the next day is when I actually heard, call it the voice of God, but it was like my my higher self, my intuition. It was the first time I actually like consciously listened to it, even though it's mm. that voice is always there inside of you. Um, so I believe that God is like within us. We, we are God, we are extensions of God, you know? Um, but on so many levels through religion, through societal programming and all kinds of programming, we are taught to believe on some level that it's outside of us versus mm. within us. Right. Yeah, I love what you shared over there. And I think I can relate to that as well. When I was a kid, my parents, my dad used to take me to the temple. So in my case, my dad is a Hindu, my mom is a Christian. So my dad used to take wow. me to the temple. And, you know, there's a sense of rebellion that goes on, right? When we are kids, I think for me, it was because I did not know the why behind it. Yeah. Like, why do you go to the temple? Why do you ring the bell? Why do you worship, you know, this deity? And I was really craving to know it. But now for me, life has taken a whole circle. And now that I'm into yoga and Ayurveda and Tantra, I know the significance behind all this from a scientific vibrational standpoint. Exactly. And it feels so good, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I totally get where you were coming from. And I love that you surrendered. And then it seemed like the universe or God put, put like something in front of you that helped you find your calling. So before that, or maybe as a child, what did you want to become as an adult? Yeah, I, I wanted to become a, a fashion designer. Okay. <laughs> and being Indian, like from an Indian background, your parents are like, become a doctor, dentist, mm. or a lawyer. That's what it right. was. Um, so I remember the day, like I was sitting down with my dad and I was applying to different universities and colleges. Um, and you know, I got into like urban landscaping design, but then I also applied for interior design, uh, fashion design and art school. Like I was, I used to be a painter. So I was so like wanting to just paint. And my dad was really conflicted with that. And so he sat me down. He's like, what about architecture? You know, like you can still be artistic. It's just, mm. you know, architect, right? So right architecture is where I ended up uh, 
getting into. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting. So what was your reaction when your dad gave you this option? My reaction, you know, it, it, I felt a lot of pressure um, mm. because it was, I really wanted to go into fashion school. My mom's, uh, she's retired now, but she was a seamstress. So I really learned all the skills about sewing, you know, understanding fabrics and whatnot from my mom. And I used to make, uh, when I was in school, like people clothes, like I would mm -hmm. just like make a vest, make a shirt, and I would make my own clothes as well. So I always had this knack for design and mm -hmm. to just sort of, see that as just a hobby that was it was actually hard it was like you know you can't make money off of that it's it's just a hobby so in my mind i really separated creativity and practicality right, right. Yeah. um which played a number on me because i think that's what really contributed to the anxiety like the panic disorder and the depression because i wasn't cultivating my creativity in any ways right. And even in architecture, like once you start working at an architect firm, um, I became an architectural technologist. A lot of it's very technical. Mm -hmm. You're not doing as much design work depending on, you know, the firm that you're working at. So I still felt like I didn't have a lot of design uh, freedom, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you would assume, you know, like you're working at a marketing agency, you would assume you're doing all the creative stuff but that, yeah. that that's not necessary right you might just be doing the selling stuff and yeah <laughs> it's like a, it's like a whole chain yeah and so yeah it's crazy and i think that's so important the role uh, that a counselor plays right and somebody who knows what kind of careers you can take it's so important to just give that child a sense of possibility and even if you don't know what lies ahead maybe just giving the, the child a sense of possibility that no matter what, if you work hard, you can, you know, become who you want to. Because I wanted to be an animator when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I used to love these 3D cartoons that used to be made in softwares like Maya. Yeah. And I remember my parents taking me to a school one day and I told that lady, I want to be an animator. And I want to someday work in Hollywood. And she told me, you know what, that's not really realistic, you know. Um, wow. <laughs> not a lot of people get into Hollywood. And then I have a good yeah. friend right now who is a art director and he's not in Hollywood, but he's doing pretty well in Vancouver. And so it just goes to show that it doesn't take a lot to like totally knock off a child's dreams. Right. And with that dream, you're yeah. not just knocking off their dreams, but their sense of what is possible and what's not. And it causes anxiety and stress. It's so true. And I always find like, as a child, our innate gifts, we actually already know what they are. As a child, mm -hmm. we actually already tapped into that. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as adults and so many people that I've worked with, I'm like, what was your favorite thing to do as a child? What's your dream? And they're like, I wanted to be a, an author or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, well, who says you can't do that now? And now they're, some of them are actually doing that because it's in a way of like, what parents have taught us and it's mm. it's no wronging them or anything it's like this is yeah. how we get accepted by society or by culture this is how you survive you know <laughs> this is how you make money yeah. so it's there's a lot of rewiring that's going on and i think there's this huge awakening um and i think the children that are here now like they you know, it's, it's amazing, like how many awakened families they are that are supporting their kids to get in touch with their gifts sooner than later. Yeah, I like the point that you bring out because you can't completely blame the immigrant parents. Like yeah. right? it's, a lot of times it's a new country. They want you just exactly. stay safe and be at home and not on the road. And so they come from a standpoint of safety and security but you know, um, sometimes you got to go beyond that. But uh, so then you started your career in architecture. Is that what happened? Yeah. So I, I've been in architecture for seven years. Okay. Uh, from 2003 to mm -hmm. 2009 ish, around there. Um, so I worked at a few architect firms and I was doing more uh, commercial. Um, 
buildings and sites. And it was so funny. I always got stuck doing site plans, which is like an aerial view of site. Okay. So dealing with bylaws, building codes. Um, and that got me more fascinated with crop circles. So by 2000. Six and nine, when I was having my awakening, I started exploring, you know, other energy healing modalities, and I had two different lives. Um, so I was kind of bridging them both and mm -hmm. looking at crop circles. And I thought, well, isn't this interesting that I'm doing all these site plans and mm -hmm. architecture? Like, it's just, just fascinating. So I was always fascinated with looking at aerial views of land. So, yeah. Yeah, that's very fascinating. I think, uh, the time between 2006 and nine was very awakening, right? It seems like yeah. there was some awake, global awakening happening. Like in 2008, I had a bad accident and that sort of kickstarted yeah. my spiritual journey. In 2008, you had the financial crisis. Yeah. It, was, it seems like a lot of stuff yeah. happened. Just like we look back in 2030 and say, 2020, something happened, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something, something big happened in 2020. Yeah. We didn't know yeah. that time, but now it makes sense. <laughs> Um, totally. <laughs> but yeah, so you, yeah. You, you, you're doing this work and you sort of were, you, I think at a soul level, you were trying to relate it to some aspect of spirituality, like crop circles and trying to make sense of it all, right? Yeah. And, so what made you leave it? What made you want to change your career? Or, yeah, you know? great question. You know, Going back to my my dad, he has this special gift of, even if he doesn't like it, he has this intuition to bridge mm. me to certain places. Like he bridged me to Vancouver, uh, even though he didn't want me to like leave being near him, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, the same thing with architecture and architecture was such a gift. I'm so grateful mm -hmm. um, because it's where I started to channel um, a modality, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, but so I started channeling these sacred geometric images. Mm. Um, and it, I just, it would, it just came naturally because I was doing so much energy work on the side yeah. that it was just like, again, it came from a place of surrendering. I wasn't controlling it. I was just working on a drawing one day and I just started channeling on the, on the computer. <laughs> yeah. That's very fascinating because yeah. you, you know, I, I read what you wrote about that experience that you had and it's fascinating because the other day, a couple of weeks back, so I do these uh, breathwork sessions on Sunday mornings with my community and these can be really, as you know, very mind opening, right? Very surreal, very powerful. And one of yeah. our listeners, one of our attendees, the next morning she posted a mandala. And wow. she said that I don't consider myself an artist. I don't consider myself, you know, um, expressive or creative. But here I am. And this is just the start. But I'm I'm drawn to these mandalas. So tell us what happened to you. And where were you? What was happening? Yeah. So I, before I even started channeling it on the computer, I used to just kind of draw these kind of mandala looking geometries on a piece of paper. Mm. And I felt energy from them and I didn't really understand what they were. I just, I just knew it spoke to me. Yeah. And then, um, so around 2008, I was working on a site plan and then all of a sudden I just started to channel, uh, an image. So it kind of looked like, like one of these, Okay. You can see it. And, um, but I felt this energy and my coworker who was mm. sitting next to me, she was like, she felt it too. She was like, what are you doing? You know, and I said, I don't know. And I spent the entire hour during work. Mm. Um, I know my bosses, my old bosses aren't watching, so I'm good. I spent my time during work <laughs> <laughs> completing it. And then I sent it home. And when I sent it to my place, I printed it out. And when I printed it out just on a piece of paper like this, I felt the energy emit from it. And I experienced this kind of like, ecstasy it felt like a homecoming mm. and it felt like a language that spoke to me that felt like home and I was mm. like oh like this is this is a part of me like this is why I'm here mm -hmm. and it went beyond what my human brain could even understand so what I did with um one of my mentors which you know Jennifer Longmore mm. she did a at the time like 2009 like a future progression on me so I went to my future self mm -hmm and had a conversation uh, with my future self. Mm. 
yeah. um, and asked what they were. Like, what, what are these geometry pieces? <laughs> and then I was shared that these are called star activations. So these star activations are energy transmissions that, um, that come through the galaxy, but they are connected to our own self. So it doesn't come from another being or a thing. It is us connected to our multi-dimensional self, our other gifts, our other soul fragments and energies. Mm -hmm. And we've been taught that we're so three-dimensional, but we have access to all the other dimensions. And so think about it as like a grid that's blocked us from accessing that part of ourselves. And then I was shown that instead of a blueprint of a building, which I was taught how to draw, mm -hmm. these are blueprints of a soul. So there was a, a transfer of understanding how to create a blueprint of a building and then transferring that of understanding a blueprint of a soul and also learning the Akashic Records. It is the blueprint of the soul. You really start to understand how one is. Um, and so with these star activation soul blueprints is what I call them or soul blueprint for personalized ones. I call them soul blueprint activators like they activate your blueprint. I get very specific information for someone. Like maybe they're supposed to start a chocolate line or write a book or something. Like they can get very specific so that mm. it, whatever you've been, you just no longer second guess yourself. And so what it does is that it deprograms, um, whether it's ancestral programming, transgenerational programming, uh, religious programming, cultural. Uh, I even go into implants, negative alien implants, um entities um like really intense heavy energies that we don't really talk about mm -hmm. <laughs> mind control implants right. um so right now i'm doing a series that works a lot with the mental body and um my guides have been showing me more about psyops and you know all the other intense stuff so that i didn't understand that mm -hmm. you know back then i was just like right. oh okay and then developed this relationship with this modality and being like, okay, show me more. And mm -hmm. the more that I, you know, cause when you channel something, you have to be authentic within yourself to receive more information. It doesn't all come to you at once and patience is needed. So like the, the beautiful woman in your breath work who channeled this mandala, it could be a starting of something. And it's okay if you don't know everything because mm -hmm. you're not supposed to know everything. It's like how much, can you handle and it's like understanding your gift and like as soon as you accept it more information comes through to you because you're able to integrate it and share that very very true way profoundly put actually and what comes to my mind is sometimes we like language is a benefit right the words that we use sometimes yeah. it can be like a crutch as well right because yeah. the words that we use is just a small portion of how we communicate Obviously, there's body language and there's vibrations and there's frequencies and there's so many more. Uh, like if you talk about snow, we know it as snow, but I think the Inuits or the Eskimos have 10, 20 different words for snow. And wow. so you can get very nuanced with language, but then when you go into vibrations, it's completely different, right? And so, uh, yeah, that's, so that's very fascinating. Um, talk to us about what's happening when we're looking at a mandala. Because you've said that there's some transmissions happening, there's some high vibrational frequencies that are being passed on to us. There's a level of familiarity that we feel when when we look at these um, these these blueprints or these mandalas. What's happening over there? Break it down for us. Yeah. So when you look at the soul blueprints, there is almost like a. I'm gonna see my camera here. There is like a familiarity that one can receive that just it again it goes beyond what your human brain can understand um, so i work with the light body and what the light body is it's your whole energy body that contains your physical body which is this your emotional body you know your emotions uh your mental body and your spiritual body and all your energy bodies so the blueprints speak to all the other bodies like most of the times we know what's going on physically um or sometimes emotionally but it looks at where there's uh an imbalance mm -hmm. 
where, where the energy body is in disharmony. And so like going into your Akashic records or doing any other energy healing, even like Reiki, right? When you get a Reiki transmission, uh, you're just lying down or you're standing up and you're just receiving this energy, but that energy goes to where it needs to flow to, whether mm -hmm. it's like an yep. emotion or whatever, and it just harmonizes. Mm -hmm. So the soul blueprints does something very similar and it works on a very deep level of activating the, the light body body. So let's just say if you've been bombarded with so much stuff from media, family, da -da -da -da, <laughs> work, mm -hmm. and then you're feeling disconnected, like you're feeling discombobulated and you're just yeah. physically like, ugh. By receiving like the star activation transmission, it starts to, you know, pull out the stagnation and just reharmonize. So by reharmonizing, it it reconnects uh, the disconnect of the mental body and the physical body and your emotional body. And what will happen is that you just start to align back to your blueprint. Mm. And then you start to remember who you are and you're like, oh, this is who I am. This is how I operate. This is my truth. And you take action through that. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Now, yeah. in your explanation a while back, and I'm going to, you know, gently sidestep our conversation for a moment. Yeah. Where, <laughs> when you spoke about um, alien implants. What's, what's an alien implant? Yeah. So there's all kinds of uh, alien implants. It's funny. I don't think I've ever talked about this like live on a podcast before. So uh, <laughs> here's my first. So we have, you know, we can have positive implants, but there's also negative alien implants. I've dealt with people in the military who have been implanted uh, with a lot of thoughts. And, and, and so people from the police force or if they've been in the military, um, I find that coming out of it, they've had a hard time being in relationship because yeah. they've been taught to disconnect yeah. their mental body from their emotional body. Because um, if you're going out at war and you're with your colleague and you see your colleague get, you know, ex they explode in front of you, you can't react. You have to stay disconnected. And, you know, so there's that's like an implant, um, which can actually cause a lot of harm because mm -hmm. it disconnects the mental body from the emotional body. Right. Um, so that's an example. Sometimes they can be actual physical implants. Yeah, microchips. You know, like getting a, like getting a vaccine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I know my. Uh, I've seen you know people pull out implants and some energy healing uh, stuff. I've seen some wild things, um, and it can be negative alien plant implants, meaning it's not necessarily from like a negative. Uh, entity though it can be but it could be just a foreign energy that is mm. unknown to earth that is not earthbound that is that is there to distract you from connecting to your gifts that is there to distract you from connecting to the truth so they're kind of like distraction implants so that can also happen through entertainment like in media and stuff that like or like right. addiction like if you're constantly looking at Instagram, or you're just like scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. There's a lot of, it also ties into subliminal programming. Like there's a lot of subliminal messages. Yeah. Um, so I, again, I work a lot with the mental body. And when I'm speaking to someone, I like through a session, mm -hmm. I can see what's happening with their mental body. And I'm like, oh, they've got a lot of subliminal programming or there's an mm -hmm. implant. Um, how you know if someone's got an implant is you can they're they've got this glaze over their eyes it's almost like when you're speaking to them they're like looking past you and you're like you know you don't know <laughs> you're just mm. like you feel the this disconnect and you're like oh I feel kind of weird and they'll touch you in weird areas so if someone is speaking to you and they touch you in like very sensitive areas so the inside of the elbows mm. the inside of the wrist the back of the neck, the shoulders. Yeah. Those are very sensitive spots. Um, and it's not saying that, you know, people are consciously doing it. 
Uh, they can do it if they've been taught in a program, like how to program people. Yeah. Um, and I've had, you know, uh, men and teachers in particular that would touch certain areas while speaking to me. And I know they're doing some sort of, you know, NLP or I don't know what. So mm. in my intentions, I asked to cancel it out because it doesn't work. So it's like, you should come mm. to my Tantra class or whatever. <laughs> 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 it, and, and so that's yeah. another form of implant and you're just like oh you know if you are not aware of and how you know it's it feels icky so yeah. if you do experience it energy follows intent uh you can just intend with inside of yourself if i have attracted any implants or taken anything in please transmute it now right immediately lovingly yeah, that's so interesting because I think um, a lot of people don't know about this. And I think in 1974, the people who started asking questions about all these things, the CIA gave them the term conspiracy theorists, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it was a way for them to stop asking questions and making the people look, you know, like like in a way, uh, collective yeah. hypnosis, right? Yeah. But if people read the declassified documents of CIA, you'll know the type of projects that they've embarked on because they know what the truth is. They know what's happening out there. They know the power of psychic warfare and things like that. And I know that there is also a document, and people can search this also, declassified document, Mars. um, There was some some incident where they hired a psychic to project, astrally project into Mars and go back in time like a million years back. And this is declassified document. And Interesting. It's on the website, right? And not a lot of people know this. But I wonder if it's the same person who projected into the moon because there is uh, something about the moon as well. Right. But you can send that over to me. I'd love to see that. Yeah. So this person went, <laughs> yeah. not, not only did they go to Mars, yeah. projected into Mars. And yeah. so it's basically a transcript and he's like floating in space and he's telling them what he's seeing. And then he goes back in time a million years back. And what he sees is um, pyramids, just like in Egypt. Mm. He's seeing them on Mars. And he's seeing that uh, the people are kind of scared because the life is coming to an end over there. And so that was pretty fascinating. So that suggests through this experiment that there was not only life on Mars, but it might have been similar to Egypt. Um, but yeah, so it's so fascinating that you yeah. share that with us that we might have these implants or whatever alien energy in our bodies that are that's sort of holding us back um, from really taking inspired action. And so the mm-hmm. next question I wanted to ask you is sacred geometry because that's such a fascinating topic, right? We see it all around in nature, um, you know, everywhere we go, um, in flowers and plants and you know, in animals. So what is your understanding of sac- sacred geometry? And how does it influence us? Yeah, like you, like, as I mentioned, I was fascinated with crop circles. And then I went into Mm. sacred geometry, like I um, studied a little bit about the flower of life, like way back when and, and I was just fascinated with this language, I just wanted to understand it. Um, But I also felt like you know, whatever's been written so far, it, it also feels a little bit limiting. Like, I feel like there's more to it. Um, I've been looking at like Nassim Harriman's stuff about the unified theory, which really resonates with the soul blueprints. Cause I look at the soul blueprint, like this is just a 2d image, but really it's like a toroidal field and we're coming mm. back to the center point. And I believe in the way that I see, um, like an apple or a human is that we are, we are geometry. It's in our DNA. It's in our, our, that's, that's what we're made up of. So when I look at things, I, I see geometry, even like in architecture, it's, it's like, I feel like as society, we've forgotten about the sacredness of geometry and we've been like fast building with like buildings and forgetting about the, the energy of how it moves. Mm. Um, and then looking a little bit into, and I'm still looking into like bowel mimicry and understanding nature and building things and like, mm. um, you know, really learning how to be more gentle with our planet um, because there's a geometry in it. So how can we work with that um, even with animals? So there's so much to say about geometry, but at the same time, it's like, I, I find like it's so limiting and human words. It's like we can 
study the flower of life or a symbol, but I, yeah. don't feel like, I feel like there's so much more to it. And yeah. 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 yeah, that's very true. I mean, what you, what you're saying makes sense because you can be the most highly trained musician in the world yeah. and you might know all the, you know, the chords and the notes and the scales, you might know everything. But when you play that music, depending on how experienced you are, the audience always gets it, right? They don't need yeah. to be trained in music in order to be influenced by the vibrations that are coming from the stage, especially from the Philharmonic Orchestra, where you have, you know, 20, 30 musicians playing different instruments, but the people just get it and totally. they feel it, right? So it's beyond mm -hmm. words. So it sort of makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, coming back to the topic of the mandalas, uh, what exactly is a mandala? Maybe because the ancient Tibetans, they did a lot of mandala work, right? Yeah. The way that I look at mandalas is I, I see it different than a soul blueprint with what I channel. And I have that written up in my, um, on my website is that I see a mandala as like the a representation of the universe and how we relate ourselves with the universe. Okay. Um, whereas like a blueprint with what I channel is very specific to your, your soul, like your actual blueprint. And a mandala is like a universal image in, in our relationship to that image. So even looking at, you know, it was, it was so wild. Like my very first apartment in Vancouver, how I knew it was my apartment is I looked at the, uh, I had a beautiful one bedroom um, by the West End. And I looked at the balcony door, like the sliding door, and there is a mandala on it, and it was a Shri Yantra. <laughs> and I looked mm. at my landlord, and I was like, do you know what that is? And she, she's Australian. She's like, oh, no, it, it's just a sticker so you don't run through the door. And I was like, oh, she has no idea. Mm. But I took it as a sign of, like, that speaking to me. And, and at the time, I was studying – a little bit of the, about the Shri Yantras, you know, and, um, and Vedic philosophy. I mean, that was understand like what you said about coming back to Vedic philosophy and all that stuff. I, that's what brought me back to understand Sikhism on a whole other level mm -hmm. and understanding the deities and what they, you know, what they represent. So yeah, there's just this, uh, it's it's more of this relationship with yourself and the the universe. Uh, it's a mm. more of a universal image, whereas like a soul blueprint is very specific to to you. It's like this this if this was this is a generic one, um, but if this was like a personalized one, you can never be duplicated. Like that's mm. you, mm. and that right. that's um, how you express yourself in geometry which right. can change and evolves as well. Interesting. So what is a Sri Yantra? Because uh, I'm not familiar with that. You said oh, that I'm you saw a Sri Yantra. It. Yeah, let me, okay. I'll show you. I can. I, I wish I was Joe Rogan and I could just ask somebody to pull it up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, can you just pull that up? <laughs> I need to have some assistant maybe. I know. So, you know. We've got a big screen over here, you know. <laughs> I'm like, I know we need an image. I have the image here, but I don't think we can like. Oh, so I'll right. spell it for people. But it's okay. S H R I and then Yantra Y A N T R A. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it goes back to like Vedic philosophy, and I was like really fascinated with that, and just um, mm -hmm. it's like the universal female and masculine energy. That's what I remember from it. Right. Yeah. So it's very fascinating. And there are so many stories, obviously, then there's Vedic, um, how they use mandalas in Vedic India and how they use mandalas in Tibet. One of the stories I've heard is that in the monasteries up in Tibet, they would spend days and days together, you know, making these mandalas. And, beautiful. Right, yeah. mul multiple yeah. monks and they would, it would be so intricate and so detailed and so much yeah. time would go into it. They would spend all day on it and multiple days, like I said, and then once it was ready, they would just destroy it. They yeah. would just, right? Just <laughs> and so that speaks to the essential nature of the universe, which is constantly changing and the importance of not, um, you know, holding on to people or things or 
what we have in our life today, right? Realizing exactly. that anything can, you know, just disappear in the mist. Um, and I think that's a, that's a wonderful um, moral or something to take yeah. in, into our own lives, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, going back to what the Tibetans do, it's like they're, there's, you know, they're meditating as they do it. I've, I've watched some of it and it's it's so profound and then when you they destroy it, you're like oh, because you develop this attachment right and right. they're teaching you how to detach from the beauty that was just created yeah um, which is so fascinating and yeah. yeah like our our souls are we are always evolving and yeah. relationships evolve everything evolves and if we become attached for things to stay the same, you know, we can't, our soul can't grow. We can't, you know, move further in life. So yeah, it's a yeah. beautiful, yeah. Yeah. And the monks are just trying to teach you something that if you don't learn, the universe is going to find a way to teach you directly, <laughs> yeah. right? As we are, a lot of, a lot of us are finding people who yeah. are in jobs for five, six, 10 years, all of a yeah. sudden they're let off. People who are in relationships for 10, 15 years, all of a sudden, right? And although they might be sad and be grieving, um, what they really must know that uh, when every opportunity goes by, it's because the universe is opening up a bigger opportunity for you. But a lot mm -hmm. of times you're so connected to that old opportunity that you don't see the new opportunity that is manifesting or has manifested for you. Right? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, take yeah. the other faith. It's like when you close one door, the other one opens, right? Can't, yeah. Absolutely. And so you spoke about the fact that the uh, blueprints that you create are all unique, right? How do you ensure mm -hmm. that they're unique from one another? What's the process that goes into it? So the process is um, when someone, you know, invests in a soul blueprint activator, I call it an activator because it activates their blueprint. Um, I begin with a initial consultation. It's just like a half an hour. And I ask a very simple question. And what this question does is that it makes their energy expand um, mm. and being like, yes, I'm ready to shift. For whatever reason, I can clairvoyantly see yep. the geometry. Yeah. And then I give it about a week. And each night between 12 to 3 a.m., I start to channel. And I still use an architectural software. <laughs> <with> okay. <laughs> and, and so they're just going about their day. Um and I'm not even speaking to them. It's basically mm. their higher self speaking to my higher self. Mm. So I don't get any human interference that I can get the direct um, information that wants to come through. And I start to see the geometry of their soul. Mm. So there might be a similar shape with someone's character with someone else's character, but yet they're so different and unique. And there's not a single blueprint I've done over like 70 I think I'm at 70 right now blueprints so far, maybe a little bit more. Um, and each of them are so different mm. um, because it's just what I can clairvoyantly see. And, and then I can feel their character come through. And then once I get the information, I do a follow-up call, mm. um, with a write-up, and then I send them a JPEG and a PDF uh, or a PNG file so they can use it if they want to use it as a logo or print it out on canvas or whatever, mm. color it, use it as color therapy because right. it works as well as, you know, I've had parents do that for their kids as well. Yeah. Um, and so they just, they look at it and they're like, oh my God, this kind of looks, this looks like me. <laughs> like, this is how mm. I'd see myself. Mm. It, it actually matches their character and it's mm. like their expression and geometry. So it's, it's really hard to duplicate that. Mm. There might be one that has kind of like a similar edge, but it's because their characters are similar, which is fascinating or, yeah. Um, but yeah, everyone's blueprint. It's, and I look at them, I'm like, yeah. wow, there's not an identical. That's what made me really understand. Mm -hmm what soul blueprints are, I was like, oh, like in order to make a building, we need to understand its own foundation. We need to know right. how to build a foundation and where are we going to put the structures in? Yeah. Um, and like how it's the same as a person, like how are they built? They're not right. the same. They don't all come from the same lineage and DNA. So, yeah. yeah. 
Ah, that's very fascinating. And I know that there are a bunch of people who are watching us live right now. So if you're watching this live, then make sure that you hit the share button because that will ensure that this wonderful conversation that we're having is able to go in front of more people. And if you are watching, make sure you add a comment and say who you are so that I can give you a shout out because I love giving shout outs to people who watch these sessions live. And so, Baljeet, what you shared was very, very interesting. And one thing you mentioned was that you ask these uh, questions to people that lights them up, right? And I think that the quality of our life depends on the type of question that you're asking yourself. So it's a moment to, if you're listening to this episode, ask yourself, what are the type of questions am I asking myself? And, you know, this afternoon I was doing like a breathwork session for some people and I asked them this question, and which I always ask to people that work with me. And I said, if anything is possible, Okay. And if you could wake up and if money and time were not constraints, what would you do? Where would you, where would you be? And who would you be with? Right? Because sometimes, in most cases, money and time are the main constraints that sort of hold us back from taking big decisions. And so for a moment, ask yourself, if money and time were not a constraint, what would you be doing right now? That's very similar to what I asked, by the way. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because it, it expands the energy because we always think about what we don't want. Right. You know, versus what we do want. And it just allows me to understand someone's character. If they yeah. if they keep leaning to what they don't want, then I know yeah. there's some resistance. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a great – that's a great question. Yeah, yeah. And so um... – we were actually talking about this before we started our episode, but you're also a musician, right? You're also a DJ, a conscious yeah. DJ. So what do you mean by a conscious DJ versus a regular DJ? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned how to DJ back in 2010 uh, yeah. through uh, an ex-boyfriend of mine. And um, at the time we were dating, we were sitting on the couch. And, and it's funny because he's a DJ and mm. he, he goes – if you wanted to, what's something that you've always wanted to do that you see yourself doing? Mm. And I said to him, I said, I see myself DJing, like doing dome events and stuff like that. I said, I, I know I'm supposed to DJ. I just don't know how I'm mm. like, duh, he's like the DJ. And he's like, good, let's, let's learn. So mm. he put the controller in front of me. And what he would make me do is <laughs> create these DJ sets while he's sleeping. And then he would just like contribute critique it, which was great because I needed right. that. But then he introduced me to Dr. David R. Hawkins book called Power Versus Force. And I haven't read the whole entire thing. I have mm -hmm. the audiobook. <laughs> it's pretty intense. Yeah. But there's one part in Dr. David R. Hawkins book um, where he talks about the different energy levels and the different levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, so if songs for example have a certain consciousness and they and it, and it exudes this anger then you're processing and taking on that anger yeah and so what my ex-boyfriend and i would do is he would muscle test the level uh, like the frequency the level of consciousness within a song yeah and i would intuitively test uh like ask my higher self what's the level of consciousness of the song mm. and then we would check in with each other and we would get the same thing so then we knew what songs to pick when we would dj and we, a couple of times we dj together and so that really stuck inside of me i started to really understand oh like and i was really big in the music scene like going to clubs and like and so i noticed when i was like watching a dj play and he'd play a song and everyone's on the dance floor and they're like, yeah. But as soon as he get to another song and then people are like, yo, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm gonna go get a drink. And they just kind of leave the dance floor. I noticed the frequency dropped mm. in the field. Right. And it was because people are not taking in the lower frequency. They wanna stay in this high frequency. Yeah. So anything, I think it's anything above 210, it's like courage and it goes upwards, but it, below that it can go into jealousy and then you got anger and, fear and all that jazz. So, um, and then at the highest level is like enlightenment. So I don't know who's made a song with that high, but right. so it's usually yeah. about 210 for a good song or just like 200 or um, whatnot. Mm. So again, that stuck in me. And, and since then um, I haven't, I didn't really come out of the closet with DJing since till like 
2017. I did go to DJ school in 2012 just to mm. refresh in my skills yeah. and um, learn from a different software um, and a mixer. And I would make these DJ sets, but just more in private mm -hmm. and pick songs that I really resonated with. And then I discovered even then with checking out the different producers and stuff, like, and especially with my intuition, mm -hmm. I could tell if the producer was like high on Coke or something, or like I can feel the frequency. Right. That's very interesting. And I was like, oh, this feels dense. Like I can't use this in my set. Yeah. And so by 2017, I really started to come out. Um, I had another friend who's a DJ and producer. She really helped me and got me into a studio. Uh, we bought our own mixer and uh, just, since then, I started to get asked to go on podcasts uh, globally. So I just finished a DJ set for Deep House Dubai, which will be released soon. Um, nice. But my last set was Deep House Paris. And it's it's been wild. But each song that I craft in a mix, there is a certain frequency that I I intentionally put in to spread a message, to mm. to get people inspired, to even activate that sacral chakra, to keep that creativity going for them, that inspiration, because yeah. um, that's been repressed too. Um, so that's what I mean about conscious DJ. I'm being conscious of yeah. what I'm putting in to a mix, because yeah. I know that whoever's listening to it, there's an intention behind it. So we also have to be mindful of what we're ingesting when we watch and listen to like music, you know, yeah. watching music videos and stuff like that. Look at the entertainment industry, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's very fascinating. There's, I think an awakening happening among certain musicians to be more conscious in their, uh, uh, in what the type of music that they use, but also the type of impact that they are having on people's minds through their music. Are they uplifting people or are they dividing people and keeping them in those lower frequencies? I mean, I'm getting more and more towards being a DJ. Maybe in the future I might Yay. learn how to be a DJ because when I do the breath work, I'm also playing some music. Amazing. Iso isochronic music so that their brain waves in a way is altered and they're able to ex reach these very relaxed, comfortable, blissed out states not just through the breath, but also through the music. Um, and to me, the first time I came across the beauty of music was, I think about eight years back when I bought a product called Om Harmonics by Mind Valley. Oh, yeah. And that's when I came across the beauty of binaural beats. Yeah. And you're very right, you know, like I tend to avoid uh, nightclubs because a lot of times just the energy is very heavy and, uh, you know, people are intoxicated. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so the question that I think a lot of musicians are asking, what if you could get high on your own supply? <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. Just like uh, like when that's I think a line by Wim Hof, but it's true. You know, what if you yeah. could get high on high on your own supply through conscious vibrations that are filling in the, the room and also people that uh, are high in vibration rather than people who are low in vibration. And it's not the people. Maybe it's the music that's affecting him or influencing them in a certain way. But yeah, so yeah. thanks a lot for explaining what a conscious DJ is. It yeah, and it's sense. it's totally the intention. You're most welcome. I think it's also the intention of why someone's going to go dance and are they escaping or are they mm, intentionally, you know, um, I've got a friend that facilitates Kundalini dance and she picks the songs for each of the chakras. And um, and I, I'm more inspired to go to festivals um, yeah. because they're outdoors, they're connected to nature. And oh. people are more interested in connecting and they're there for the experience versus like mm. going into a big box club. Like it just doesn't yeah. do justice for me anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also yeah. I think there's something to say about inclus inclusiveness, right? Because I want to see a, a concert yeah. where you not only have young people, but you have old people as well. And yeah. you have youngsters as well. And everyone's dancing together. I don't know if you've yeah. seen that, but there's this old couple from, I think they're from Berlin and they've been going viral on Instagram recently, but they're like, they're where they dance like really well, you know? Oh, I think uh, I've seen the video. Yeah. They're yeah. like, they're like dancing to techno or something or house yeah, music. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like Burning Man. I mean, Burning Man is inclusive in so many ways um, where I've connected with 
people of all ages and there's no um, judgment when you make that connection and when you're dancing with them. It's, it's, it's beautiful. So where all have you played uh, as a DJ and maybe what, where's your favorite place to play or to perform? Yeah, most of my things have been um, about intentions. So I've done a couple of dome events. I did a dome event in LA mm -hmm. uh, where I DJed with another woman and it was like uh, 360 uh, visuals. And then I facilitated uh, three dome events um, at the planetarium mm -hmm. where I led like a meditation. And then I had an, another friend that facilitated ambient electronic music mm -hmm. with the visuals. So for me, it's more about providing an experience for someone versus just DJing. Okay. I played a lot locally in Vancouver. Um, I played at Burning Man, but there's so many DJs that play at Burning Man, it's it's wild. <laughs> um, but not necessarily have I, you know, been called to, ideally, I mean, I just performed at a little mini festival this weekend, just outside in Alberta. Um, so for me, it's more about community, like where I'm performing and how that creates impact for everyone versus, you know, performing a, a live concert. I've never felt this um, call to do that. And it was funny, I went to the Amsterdam event back in 2018 to mm -hmm. look at the scene and feel like what's, what's going on. Yeah. And I still felt like there was way less female DJs. And then that inclusivity of like, you know, being an Indian female DJ, um, it just felt like, I just felt like there was a disconnect with, um, the consciousness and my intentions of creating this um, transformation in people than just performing. I have no mm -hmm. desire to to just perform for the sake of performing. I mean, if, if if I know that it's gonna can create some sort of impact, then I'll I'll do it. Hence why I've been magically been invited to do a lot of podcasts. It's almost like it started off with one guy in Spain who had a big podcast, and he's like, "Hey, can you do a set for me?" And I said, "Sure." And then from there. Mm. Other people ask me to do to be a part of their podcast because it's more of whoever's listening mm -hmm. to the set, they get this experience. And I've had so many responses. Yeah. Um, I've had people write to me and be like, I listen to your set every day because it just picks me up. And that right. that gets me. Like that's how I know I'm like, oh, it's it's this is what I meant to be doing. You know, it's it's more yeah. of how can I create more impact with the music. Yeah, and I also think there's something uh, to be said about divine timing, right? It's yeah. like you try, 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 and things don't happen, maybe because you're not in alignment, and then you get into alignment because you've not only done the work, but you've had the patience to wait. So yeah. Once that happens, then you get calls from all over, right? Because people can yeah, sense your I mean, energy. I learned back in 2010, <laughs> like, <laughs> and I went to DJ school in 2012, 13, and yeah. You know, I've been really in the closet, but didn't really start to come out till 2017. And exactly. I, I feel like as an artist too, there is this, call it vulnerability. It's, it's more of like sharing your gift. And I've noticed mm -hmm. that with people that are, you know, um, ha have this thing about being a writer or doing poetry. It's so sacred mm -hmm. that by sharing that, it you have to develop this certain confidence inside of yourself that you're just channeling this, this gift. It's not really about you. It's not about me. It's not about yeah. my self importance. It's like, you know, whatever's coming through has to come through. Um, yeah. So yeah, like divine timing, I, I feel it's this readiness, your soul's readiness. And when your soul is finally ready, then mm. the next step follows. Yeah, it seems like all creators, entrepreneurs, small business owners, or people that have a vision or something that you want to manifest, there's a phase of incubation that they go through. And a lot of times it doesn't make sense logically. They're like, this is not working. That's not working. I'm getting failures here and there. And, you know, nothing seems to make sense. And I'm going through struggles. But that's just the incubation period that you're in. And the moment that you're aligned, uh, things just start to work for you. Like in my case also. For the longest time, I was not doing interviews on other people's podcasts. And people used to reach wow. out to me and I was like, yeah, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't really do, you know, I don't really do podcasts and I would say no a lot of times and, and I would find a reason to say no. But then yeah. when the alignment came, 
Um, it's just that not only the number of people who reached out to me are more now, but I'm also saying yes more. And this is mm. not yes for the sake of it, but this is an inspired yes because I feel that I'm ready and I've got so much, so many things to share that can genuinely help people and help them transform, right? And so yeah. like you said, I, don't, I just don't want to go on a podcast to perform. I want to transform and I want to enable people to transform. So that's that's a very, very fascinating. Uh, and I'll, I'll notice, like there's still times where I've been asked to perform and even go on uh, like podcasts to speak. Right. Um, and I can feel the difference. I actually don't enjoy it. Like that's I don't true. have fun. Like I know you've probably experienced that too. You just know because yeah. you don't have fun and you're like, yeah. any day now, you know, I don't even wear a watch, but I just look at my arm and I'm like, can we go? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's very true. Yeah. And maybe people do not give as much importance to this, what we're talking about as they need to, but there's something about the energy of things, right? And it's, it's there's not, nothing wrong in, if you do one of those things and, it just doesn't yeah. align, right? It's just maybe not your day or maybe the, the stars do not align properly. And maybe the next day you do it and everything works fine. And totally, you know, it's very different, but it's just, it's just phases. Um, so the question that I had was, and I think you've alluded to this a while back, but um, when you're making or when you're performing as a DJ, are you conscious of using certain type of frequencies, like maybe isochronic beats or certain beats per minute or something like that? Yeah, I tune into, I intuitively tune into where I'm performing okay. and, you know, what kind of music they're really like. I can actually feel into what the, the crowd's going to be like, and then I'll okay. intuitively know which song to pick. Okay. Um, so I don't exactly add like 432 hertz and all that stuff. Um, it's more of how I'm choosing to show up in energy because I'm being a vessel as a conduit. So whatever I pick will just, you know, if I'm a vessel of this energy conduit, that will just emit through the songs that I pick anyways and put together. And there's times where, you know, during a set before, you know, performing, I have picked my songs, mm -hmm. but then when I'm there, I'm looking at the crowd and everything. And then I'm like, Oh, I'm feeling you know, an energy shift and I need to use this song to mm. shift it. Um, so I might tweak it up because I, in that moment, I'm, I'm already intuitively feeling something. So mm. a lot of it's based on how I work is, is on intuition <clears throat> of feeling the, what's going on collectively. And then, and it's fascinating because what I've <clears throat> noticed is that there is a, people start to warm up and then yeah. there's this climax. Yeah. So it, it really is moving through the chakras. Okay. That's and then, true. and then it's almost like each of the songs I'm like moving through the chakras and then, cause I can feel okay. the energy move. Right. And then as soon as we get back and ground towards the end of the set, you can already tell people are like, okay, I'm good. Let's go get some hot chocolate or a drink or whatever. I don't know <laughs> why they're good. Okay. And I can feel, and then I'm done too. I'm like, I'm good. Um, okay. yeah, so it's, it's this, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm really getting into, uh, dance music these days, you know, listening to a lot of dance music, summer beats, you know, yeah. just, just light beats, but also the, 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 the type of frequencies that are being used makes a difference. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting more and more there, you know, cause before yeah. I've gone through phase and I still love rock and alternate rock and hip hop, but I think there's something to say about, um, these beats and a lot of them they stem from the shamanic beats right the shamanic drums yeah and yep. uh, the ancient routines and rituals that people used to go to to come together as a community and vibrate together and feel together yep. right yeah. yeah some of the sets that i've done um i've included more of eastern sounds so like east indian sounds to add this element of spice and i've feel like it switches something like it's like people mm. get a taste of um this frequency and i don't yeah. know how to describe it but it just takes them to a whole other realm yeah. um the deep house paris that i did i mean people really love that because there, there's a lot of east indian elements to it yeah um and yeah and i feel like with using and honoring the the eastern influences even the shamanic influences and adding that in is so yeah. sacred 
Um, I feel like now there are way more artists out there that are, you know, creating amazing music that are conscious, um, even hip hop artists. Uh, I actually have a friend, he's a rock musician and he's, he's so aware and that's his mission, you know, and, yeah. um, and electronic music, there's a lot of people just like waking up and like, they have this deeper feeling to create something that has a, a sense of connection to them. Um, right. So it's probably why you're feeling called to listen mm. more because it's like, it's this match and frequency. Yeah. Um, whereas the way that we've been raised, I mean, there's, we've been raised to really idolize mm -hmm. um, people and just love them for whatever they're creating versus I mean, there are some connections that you get from artists. Like I talk about Jimi Hendrix. Like I don't, I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. I just <laughs> connect. Like, right. and you know, he's a rock musician. He was yeah. a rock musician, right? But it's it's more of this wisdom or something, the frequency um, that I connect with. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I totally resonate, and I think that phase was a very rebellious phase where people yeah. were experimenting with a lot of different hallucinogenic substances yeah. and expanding their minds and, exactly, and, yeah. and asking questions and why should I fight the Vietnam War? And so that yeah. was like a really good phase for the USA to be in. But I sense also these days, a lot of people are, there's a sense of going back that's happening where people are really rede rediscovering what their true roots are and going beyond the status quo of what uh, society wants them to perform and be like and what radio wants them to play, the yeah. certain beats that has mainstream appeal uh, where people are going back. So like India, people are discovering their roots in yoga, tantra, Ayurveda, Chinese, people are going to Taoist roots and Qigong. Mm -hmm. and you have the people in Scandinavia who are discovering their shamanic histories as well. And also South America, I mean, yeah. already there's there's this you know, resurgence of ayahuasca, plant medicine, and all these, yeah. and then the music also, right? So mm -hmm. I think when we go back into our roots, we have something more to contribute because exactly. we can share in a better way, right? Yeah, I I totally agree with you. I feel like with the amount of deep work that I've been doing over so many years, I yeah. feel like it's totally contributed to the music um, the mixes that I've been creating, like my even my mixes that I've listened to last year are different than this year yeah. um, because I've noticed a shift with inside of myself and, you know, the journeys that I've done and whatnot. So I, I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just fascinated by how technology is going to shape all of this because then now you're going to have VR, right? So virtual reality, you put on the, put on the headset and then you are you know, taken in the midst of like a DJ set with thousands of people yeah. around us. What's yeah, <laughs> and geometry. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Like, you know, dancing be beside animated mushrooms? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've always had this vision about doing uh, transformational dam uh, dome events inside of a dome, like in person. Okay. Um, virtual reality is it's amazing as well where people can really go in and have this experience with sound. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like it's so important to have an experience in person with visual and sound so that as you're moving, you can really ground and integrate. I've done some VR stuff and I always found that I don't feel grounded. And there is a certain piece that's missing. It's and it's it's you feel a little bit disconnected from your physical body. It's really weird. Um, so to have some sort of virtual reality thing where you're creating this transformational experience with sound, yeah. I feel it's really important to have something that can ground a person because it can really. Again, I work a lot with the mental body. It can really disconnect someone even more. Mm -hmm. um, so my vision is actually doing in-person stuff in the dome yeah. um, where, you know, no one's idolizing and putting people on a pedestal. Like everyone is seen equal and we're just having this movement, this transformation, this dance. And it's through that movement where you're grounding, you're, you're moving energy, you're moving mm -hmm. all that stagnate stagnation with the sounds, you're making noise, you know, with your, yeah. your voice. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's true. Obviously, the in-person experience is obviously the best. Um, nothing in compared to having an in-person experience. I do agree as well. The you have energy. no one to talk to you when you do virtual reality. You have no <laughs> one to talk to. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And well, uh, I guess hopefully the 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 uh, this crazy pandemic lifts off and people are able to travel. Uh, but what are your thoughts on the pandemic so far? I mean, any epiphanies? Any new openings, any meanings that you've drawn from what's happening collectively right now? Yeah, I feel like we we are all going through a major awakening. Um, the pandemic, the pandemic, whatever you want to call it, has mm -hmm. come and we're all awakening, whether we choose to like it or not. Yeah. Um, and... I feel like we are all ascending to a higher level of consciousness and there we have to also be mindful about everyone's journey because what I've noticed even within myself I feel like I've left my old identity behind and I'm still grieving fragments of my old identity I really am mm -hmm. and I've noticed with people that I've been speaking to have been feeling the same thing yeah. um, so when I mean that we're all ascending is that we are being forced to really let go of our old identity meaning our old ways of how we showed up in relationship how maybe there's certain things in our business that is literally not working anymore especially if you used to do things in person and you're being called to do things online. Maybe you need to shift in how you're showing up with creating music or whatever that may be. But if you have resistance to the change and you're so stuck um, in that mold, you'll experience more chaos um, mm -hmm. in that reality um, and disconnect or even illusion almost like everything's fine in my world like this sheer cognitive dissonance <laughs> of not really you know i i feel that <clears throat> there's been more <clears throat> excuse me truth and exposure of what's really going on in the world because people are starting to question yeah. what we've been taught yeah you know right from a child um so i've taken a lot of red pills i've gone down quite a few rabbit holes <laughs> and mm. done my yeah. research yeah i feel it's important for you know, if you're being called to to always question, you know, like to go deeper, even yeah. in spiritual teachings, um, there's some things that I'm like, I now question, you know, anything that's been taught in a way that puts people on a pedestal. Mm. Um, that doesn't work for me. Now that yeah. if that's part of my inner rebel. I just don't do well, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's a gift too, because I question that. I'm like, what's what's behind that, you know? Mm. Um, and I also feel like even a lot of leaders too will be questioning, you know, what they've been taught. So it's it's really, really deep with what's been going on right now. And it's there are things that are like what we all don't know. Mm. Um, and I feel that compassion is very much needed because a lot of us are going at the level that we need to go. We can't force anyone Yeah. what they need to know. That's up to their own free will and their willingness, whatever their soul contract is to be, you know, like to whatever they need to know in this lifetime. And so what's really important is that as an individual, and this is part of our sovereignty, is what does my soul need to do right now? Mm -hmm. And what direction do I need to take? And that's that's part of the awakening is is this deep level of sovereignty and and understanding that we never really had freedom, even though we thought we had freedom. You know what I mean? Like we're really discovering yeah. that. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's an awakening on so many levels. It'll continue. Um, you know, there'll definitely be more. I mean, Mama Gaia is, you know feels our emotions and there will be more natural stuff happening natural mm. weather causes yeah um because we we are like there's a lot of us that are angry we're feeling it we can feel everything so it's this is part of the awakening 
Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think for me, what I draw is it's an opportunity to go within. Yeah. If you look in yoga, there's a there's a there's a mudra where you're literally covering your eyes, you're covering your nose, you know, your mouth, your ears, right? Where you, and and so basically, you're trying to focus on your third eye within. And the other day, in fact, maybe a month back, I was wearing a mask, and I was wearing earphones, and I was wearing a pair of glasses. And so the metaphor that I drew from that was I was doing something similar unconsciously. Mm-hmm. And to me, it is the universe is encouraging all of us to go within. Yeah. Especially since we can't really have the same kind of meetings that we used to have before. Or at least the government does not want us to. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, <laughs> it's an opportunity to go within and really ask ourselves, am I really living in alignment? Am I doing this job because I love it truly? Yeah. Or because I'm forced to do it? And if not, what do I really truly want to do? And coming back to the first question is, if money and time were not a const- constraint, then what would I truly mm-hmm. be doing? But also asking these questions, right? Which you and relationships. I've seen a lot of people break up. Because <laughs> they've just, they're, now that they're, you know, been at home for so long with their partners, yeah. they're really realizing they've either gotten deeper yeah. um, or they've, you know, time's up and it's all good. It's like, it's this like, um, quantum leap that's what it feels like yeah and the inner reflection for sure very true and uh you know to perhaps close our discussion on this wonderful topic uh one of the first hymns in the rig veda i'm not sure if you know this but it's called anasatya sukta and if you read that hymn it's all about questions so they ask oh wow i've never what is the stars who's the sky and then towards the end of it uh, there's a question that says, who is God? Maybe even God does not know. So it's like questioning God even, right? Because a lot of people think that Hinduism is all about worshipping deities. No, if you look at the Rig Veda, it's all about having like a seeking spirit and asking questions and not accepting the status quo. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that is the theme that we are sort of discussing about today. Um, you know, for somebody who is really enjoying this conversation, what is that next step that you would uh, <coughs> recommend for them? Um, yeah, you can visit my website at lotusdestiny.com. Mm-hmm. I have a tickle in my throat all of a sudden, <laughs> <laughs> right at the end. Um, and you can see all my offerings, and you can also check out my DJ set uh, at lotusdestiny.com. It'll connect you to my SoundCloud. There's also a freebie on my website, so if you want to tune in to a Star Activation Healing, uh, just sign up, and then you'll get the healing right away. Cool. We'll have these up in the show notes. Action Tribe, I hope you enjoyed today's session so far. We're learning that certain shapes, certain patterns, certain vibrations have an influence on us. Depending on what we're receiving, we might either feel stressed or we might experience a deep sense of healing. It's time to look around in nature and note the geometrical patterns that you're seeing in animals and things and and clouds, maybe in a flower or a vegetable. Uh, because in doing so, we are aligning with a sacred consciousness of life. And that's probably why Pythagoras said thousands of years back, there is a geometry in the humming of strings, and there's music in the spacing of spheres. And that was a quote by Pythagoras. I'm not sure if he actually said that. He probably did. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, we'll just say is, he did. We'll just yeah. say he did. He didn't yeah. have a social yeah. media account. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We can go back and cancel them, you know, yeah, if, he, yeah. if he didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we come to the last round for today, which is the wisdom round. Uh, four questions that our listeners can take note and take action. So Baljeet, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? Yeah, the best piece of advice that I ever received is power is not outside of you. It's always within you. And once you really connect to that power that's already within you, everything changes. And if you could turn back time and spend one hour with someone who is living or dead, who would it be? Mm. I read away. I have a dear soul brother who passed away um, named Trevor. So he's the first person that came through. So, yeah. And what is one thing you do in the morning or maybe in the evening before you go to sleep that has improved the quality of your life? Um, Every morning, I actually go into my Akashic Records 
and I set my intentions for the day. Mm -hmm. And then every evening, it's sort of the same thing. I just set my intentions and I just, I actually speak with my guides. I kind of tune in for the day. It's like a recap. And then I go to bed. <laughs> Got it. And if you could recommend one book for our <laughs> listeners today, what would it be? This was interesting. So when I saw that question, I was like, I don't really read books anymore because there's a lot of unlearning to do. Um, but the book of life, which is the Akashic record. So that's the etheric book. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. So actually, wait, this is the etheric book. I was going yeah, to recommend the... <laughs> that people listen to it on Audible, but I guess you can't find it on Audible. No, you? you have to learn how to open up your own Akashic records and okay. that's your book of life. The okay. best book ever. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks a lot for clearing that up yeah. for me. Because otherwise people would go into Audible and say, wait, like, maybe there's another book that's available. But it's there not probably the is a book of life. But yeah, yeah. probably. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Action Tribe, if you would like to receive any book for free, any book that you that has been on your mind and you've been wanting to read, then know that as a listener of My 7 Chakras, you do get one free credit uh, courtesy of audible.com, especially for My 7 Chakras listeners, so that you can listen to a book instead of reading a book. And in most cases, the author themselves read out the book to you. So in case you want that free gift, go to my7chakras.com forward slash free book, my7chakras.com forward slash free book. It's a fun experience. Just listen to... <coughs> Just listen yeah, to a book. Got, yeah. I'm getting the throat thing too. Yeah. <laughs> Activating our throat chakra. It's good. Exactly. Uh, so, Valjit, thanks a lot for sharing all your wisdom with us, your stories and uh, your ideas. Um, and I'm sure that this has uh, created a spark in many of our listeners' minds as they now um, ask more profound and empowering questions as opposed to questions that bring them down. Before you go, tell us one thing that you're really grateful for. And uh, I think you've already shared your website link, but maybe you can share it once again so that people can take note. Yeah, just go to lotusdestiny.com. Um, you can also catch my Instagram, Lotus Destiny. Um, I have stuff up there as well. And what was the other question? What are you grateful for? This oh, what am today? I grateful for? Oh, my goodness. Uh, honestly, I'm I'm really grateful for fresh air. Mm -hmm. I think we th forget about our breath. Grateful for our breath and being able to breathe. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for sharing, Action Tribe. If you're on Instagram, um, and especially if you're watching this right now, then go to Instagram. First, take a screenshot of this episode, then go to Instagram and share it as an Insta story and tag both of us, Lotus Destiny and my and at my seven chakras, so that we can share this story with our community and your community. And as next steps, if you are interested in the power of breath work, and if you want to do some breath work with me, because I'm an instructor and we do these wonderful sessions on Zoom every Sunday, then join our Facebook group. That is my seven chakras.com forward slash tribe. My seven is a word, my seven chakras.com forward slash tribe. And you will really enjoy this experience as you are taken higher and higher. You'll feel like you're floating. You'll feel relaxed, calm, and you'll feel like yourself. And if you have any feedback, questions, observations about this particular episode, then email me. My uh, address is aj at my seven chakras.com. That's aj at my seven chakras.com. So, Balji, thanks a lot for joining us on today's episode, talking to us about the power of soul blueprint activations as well as mandalas and sacred geometry and taking us one step closer to a human revolution. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.